Well, we usually think of the military protecting us from enemies that attack us with weapons. But could our greatest vulnerability right now actually be our financial system and our currency? Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and Presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush used bailouts and money printing to save us from another Great Depression, or so they tell us. But our next guests argue those very actions are the first steps in a global crisis and currency war. Sounds right up our alley. James Rickards is the author of the provocative new book, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. Also with us, John Brown, former British Parliament member and current senior market strategist for Euro-Pacific Capital. And I welcome you both to the conversation. In brief... Hello, Dylan. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, and I'll start in the studio with you, James, here. The history of corrupt governments manufacturing a currency in order to preserve their own power dates back to Nero in Rome, if not before. There's nothing new about this. Well, that's exactly right. You know, during the Roman Empire, they had a silver coin, which is a good store of value. But when they wanted, when they were running, in effect, budget deficits in the Roman Empire, they would change the composition, put in some lead or copper or other elements, debasing the currency. Which was their money printing. Correct. That's the exact equivalent of that. And there are many, many examples of that throughout history. The Weimar hyperinflation is a very well known one. But it's also true that some of the strongest, greatest, longest lasting empires had solid money. The Republic of Venice and the Byzantine Empire had periods of 300 years of price stability because they used gold. Because they had capital requirements. Correct. Well, in fact, if gold, was, gold, gold was, was the, the capital requirement. Capital. That's right. Banks were required to have it. And so this is all well and interesting, John, from a perspective of a financial market player or a politician of some kind, perhaps. But if I am an average American, an average Western European, an average Japanese or Chinese citizen, Brazilians, I don't care what. What is the actual risk to the fabric of society, whether it was in Rome when they were printing money or in Brussels and Washington, D.C., where they're doing it today? Well, first, I totally agree with James. And what we're witnessing is a currency crisis that has been camouflaged by politicians as a debt uh, default problem. And it has been created not by Wall Street, but by central bankers, led in particular by the Fed under B Greenspan and Bernanke. So now the US dollar is actually at the epicenter, although shielded for the moment by the euro. And we're watching a threat to the whole fiat or paper money system. And that would create a mammoth uh, depression and abject poverty for everybody. So everybody's got to be really yeah. worried about it. What, what can you do and, about and it? And you saw yesterday. Well, the first thing is you, I think you have to start cutting government waste rather than spending. And you have to get r down to restoring faith in money, in paper money. There has to be a return to some form of gold link, even if it's just for central banks, as it was until 1971, from 1944 to 71. That was only for yeah. central banks. The next stage would be to get back to a full gold standard that we had before, uh, which was where sterling and dollars were convertible into gold by individuals. And that is a true, honest money system. I don't mind what the price is. Of course, people argue there's not enough gold, but it depends what price. If you took the conversion price at $10,000 an ounce, then there might well be enough gold without causing a recessionary yeah. influence. Uh, but in the meantime, people... People are angry, very angry, and I can sympathize with a lot of these people on Occupy Wall Street, but they've got the wrong target. They're going for Wall Street, which were like someone's opened the candy store, st broken the door open, and they're finding all the children who eat the sweets rather than the criminal who broke the door open, which was a central bank, in particular the Fed. And now we've got France and Germany talking about cut and run. Oh, we'll have a two-tier euro system. That means they're going to leave the pig countries to flounder on their own yeah. and all their lenders to flounder and all their credit default swap insurers to flounder. I mean, it's a sign of disaster. I want to get uh, James uh, back in for just one second, John. I'm sorry. And if you were to, to look, James, at the, the, do, the, 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 the risk scenario, mm -hmm. 
It's one of those risks that if you are debasing your currency, as we know for a fact America is, as right. we know for a mathematical fact the Eurozone is, as we know the Chinese are, for that matter. Right. I mean, they, this is a, a, a political tool that uh, wealthy nations are using against one another. It's why it's a, called a currency war. Throughout, throughout That's, history. Right. That's why yeah. it's a war. Right. But if you were to look at the liability of that, which is seen in the Italian lira, for right. instance, where it's all of a sudden ten thousand dollars for a cup of coffee. Right. Right. Do, do what I'm, is the end game for the average American of a currency war? Right. There are a lot of costs to this, but the greatest cost is the loss of trust. The dollar is a sort of a contract between the government and the people. And if you're the government, if I can't trust you Absolutely. to maintain the currency, how can I trust you with anything else? So I think you'll begin to see other institutions flounder because they've lost trust in the in the most basic compact, which is the dollar itself. Um, you know, a, a hyperinflation is a possibility, but deflation inflation is another possibility. The Fed's supposed to have maintain price stability. I've written and spoken a lot about the gold standard. We, I think we'll probably get there through chaos. I actually favor a king dollar. I would like to see a strong dollar. I'd like to see the Fed raise interest rates, make the U.S. a magnet, reward savers instead of spenders, make the U.S. a magnet for investment abroad, make the U.S. the dollar the go-to place when you want to put your money to work. Entrepreneurship, innovation, strong dollar, that's what I would favor. And it's not just an economic threat, it's a threat to national security. How are we going to have a presence in the world, project force, you know, project force abroad if we have a weak currency. There's a lot to pay for there, and yeah. the Pentagon's worried about it. Um, and uh, uh, John, I'll send a note to anybody I can find down at the occupation to occupy the Federal Reserve and occupy Brussels. Well, I, very interesting, Dylan, you say that. Did you notice that Bernanke is now flirting with the military? Does he fear demonstrations against the Fed, yeah. which would be far more understandable than those on Wall Street? Yeah, and, and again, uh, Information is widely available, and a lot of the folks involved in this are very well informed already, and more important, I think, are very anxious to become better informed. Um, a pleasure to have the conversation, guys. John Brown, uh, James Rickards, congratulations Thank on the book, Dylan. James, Thank as you, well. Uh, firing back. We also saw U.S. Congress just come out with a report saying that the renminbi could mount a challenge to the dollar in five to ten years. You say that challenge is going on now and a currency war is going on. Uh, how is it playing out? Well, you know, everyone likes to accuse the Chinese of currency manipulation. Look, every country manipulates this currency to some extent, or what we call manipulation, they call policy. Uh, so I don't think anyone's exempt from that. But the, the U.S. is the biggest currency manipulator in the world. When you look at uh, quantitative easing, which is just money printing, we had QE, QE2, and this new operation twist, all forms of monetary ease. Uh, people think it's about lowering interest rates. It is a little bit, but it's really about cheapening the value of the dollar. Uh, the theory is that if you have a cheaper dollar, it makes U.S. exports more attractive, so we'll sell more Boeing aircraft or General Electric wind turbines, et cetera. The problem is it's, it starts out okay, but it never works out that way. There's retaliation. Other countries try to cheapen their currencies, where they put on capital controls, where they put on excise taxes, and currency wars turn into trade wars. And I describe two previous currency wars in my book, what I call Currency War I in the 1920s and 30s, and Currency War II in the 1960s, 70s, on into the 80s. They both had disastrous results, and we're starting down that road again. There's a temptation to think you can get a quick fix for your economy by cheapening your currency, but it never works out that way. It just causes inflation, stagflation, recession, and retaliation. And I want to get a little bit more into those, uh, the history of those two wars, but first I want to bring in our producer, Dimitri Kofinas, because he has a specific question he wanted to ask you about this. Hi, right, Mr. Rickards. So I want to stay with that issue of manipulation, and also you brought up currency wars one and two. And in the second currency war, a lot of people don't actually know, and you talk about this in your book, that uh, there was a private market for gold before Nixon closed the gold window, and that's what the London gold pool was about, and it was about the suppression of the price of gold because the, the central banks and the governments didn't want the, the markets to push up the price and to expose kind of the money printing that was going on during the 60s. What do you think is the analogy today? Is there an analogy? And what sort of market manipulation do you see by governments and central banks to suppress not only the price of gold, but any kind of indicator that shows what the, government is, the governments are doing as far as these currency wars are concerned? Right, it's a good question to meet you. There's always been a private market in gold in addition to the gold standard. Now, the classical gold standard of the 1870s, the private market and the public market were the same because countries were responsible and they managed their currencies in such a way to maintain the price of gold. When you come forward to the 1960s, what was happening was the official price of gold was $35 an ounce, but the private market was getting up to 40, 41, 42. So the G7 governments plus Switzerland intervened and started selling gold into the market to drive the private price back 
back down. In theory, if it went too low, they would buy some gold and kind of conduct open market operations. What happened over the course of the 60s was that the gold selling operation, the manipulation operation, got out of control. They, they were just losing too much gold. And by 1968, it was a one-way bet. Uh, the private market was up here, and, and people were just buying all the gold that governments would offer. So they, they closed down the London gold pool. We remained on the gold standard until finally 19, 1971. President Nixon said, sorry, even, even countries can no longer get gold from the United States, and gold was abandoned completely. Now, today, the market price of gold, we all know, is about uh, seven, between seventeen and $1,800 an ounce. Uh, I like to say we're still on the gold standard. I get paid in dollars, but I'll, I'll go out and buy gold bullion and you know, put it in secure storage. So I, I've got my own uh, you know, gold supply, and I recommend the same thing for other investors. So you're still on the gold standard, just not at a fixed price. Um, but to go back to a gold standard, which is one of the things I talk about in the book, the implied price of that is much, much higher, on the order of, say, $7,000 an ounce. It's not a pie in the sky uh, you know, projection. It's just the ratio of paper money to gold. When you actually do that math, that's where you come out. There's a range, but that's about where you come out. So what's going on today? We have seen gold lending operations. There was a footnote in the, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, annual report the year before last that disclosed this. This is, uh, by the way, Central bank operations in gold, that information is kept as secret as nuclear war fighting codes. I mean, it might actually be easier to find out how to launch a nuclear missile than to find out what the Fed does in the gold market. It's, they're, you know, they're lying to the people. They're not uh, transparent about what they're doing. There is manipulation going on. The extent of it is hard to say. Uh, the exact operations, whether it's leasing or, or other kinds of price suppression or conspiracy, Difficult to say, but it's clearly going on. Speaking of manipulation, Mr. Rickards, and government manipulation of gold, in 1933, the government actually confiscated private citizens' gold. Right. Uh, and you've talked about how the New York Fed holds a lot of gold for other countries uh, here in the United States. Do you think that confiscation of private citizens' gold or of other countries' gold could be a possibility? Well, I'm always amazed that you go back to the first day of the Roosevelt administration, FDR, in 19, March 1933. He issued a series of executive orders, and he did confiscate all the gold of all the U.S. citizens. He also closed every bank in the United States. Every bank was shut down. It was called the bank holiday. Can you imagine a president trying to do that today? I mean, I can't. By the way, the no. legal authority is still there. The legal authority hasn't changed. I think if the, if the government came after uh, people's gold today, there'd be a lot of resistance. But I say it's not necessary. What the government will do, if, if you see the price of gold go to five, six, seven thousand dollars an ounce, which I think it will, in order to stabilize money. They'll just put on an excise profits tax. They'll say, all you people who bought gold at say a thousand or twelve hundred, it's now worth six thousand. Well, that's an unfair windfall profit, and we're going to put a ninety percent windfall profits tax on you. Government's done things like that before, so they won't confiscate the gold. They'll just tax away all your profits. Uh, as far as the foreign gold in the United States, that's a very interesting question. A lot of people don't know Fort Knox was built to hold the gold that FDR took from the American people. They, they ran out of room in the basement of the Treasury and they had to build a, a vault. U.S. gold is not at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The U.S. gold is uh, half at Fort Knox and half at West Point. But there are 6,000 tons of gold at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that belongs mostly to Europe, Japan, and the IMF. Now, I'm not saying this would happen lightly or any time in the near future, but in extremis, if you saw a collapse of the dollar, the U.S. could confiscate that gold there's another 3,000 tons out by JFK Airport and where in vaults run by Scotiabank and HSBC, they could confiscate that gold. So with the U.S. 8,000 tons, 6,000 tons from Europe and 3,000 tons from private hands, the U.S. would have you know, upwards of 17,000 tons, which would be 70% of the official gold supply in the world. That's about where the United States was in 1944 at the end of World War II when we started Bretton Woods. So the U.S. could really reboot the entire financial system and issue a new gold-backed dollar. It's like starting the game over and wiping out all the debts. Wow. And speaking of a gold-backed dollar, I want to talk just real briefly about SDRs, which is a currency that the IMF would issue. Do you think it would be possible right. for them to do that with any credibility without it being backed by something like gold? Well, they're certainly going to try. I think in the end it'll fail. It's a very good question, Lauren, but I think they'll try. I think this is the preferred solution of the elites, what I call the Davos crowd, uh, you know, the power elite, the central bankers, the finance ministers, the treasury officials, people of the IMF, et cetera. The, the easiest way to think about it, the Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. The ECB, European Central Bank, has a printing press. They can print euros. 
Well, the IMF has a printing press too. They can print these uh, SDRs or special drawing rights. It's world money. Uh, it's not backed by anything. It can be handed out and countries can actually count it as part of their reserves and use it to settle their balance of trade with each other. And they can swap it for other currencies and use those to spend or invest. So it's just another form of printing money. It's completely unaccountable. I mean, who elected the IMF? Uh, but the thing is, the next time there's an acute phase of the financial crisis, something like the Lehman moment in 2008, it's going to be bigger than the Fed. The Fed took their balance sheet from 800 billion to 3 trillion to fight off the crisis in 08. What are they going to do? Go to 9 trillion? That's right. not credible. But what they will do is print these SDRs. So, there, so I view the entire future of the international monetary system as a race between SDRs and gold. I think gold's going to win, but SDRs will give it a run for the money. Well, that's interesting. It's certainly something to think about, as many of the guests right here on this show predict that there will be a Lehman moment coming out of the Eurozone crisis. So pay close attention to that interview. That was James Rickard, Senior Managing Director at Tangent Capital Partners, author, of course, of Currency Wars 2. James Rickards was brought in by the Pentagon in 2009 to actually play a financial war game. And again, he's Senior Managing Director at Tangent Capital Partners and author of the book currency wars and he told us how this game played out he actually played china he worked together with russia and they went after the u.s dollar here's what he did russia has been disadvantaged time and time again they sort of try to play by the rules the rules of the dollar system but uh they, they get into these uh, periodic currency collapses so uh, we were working uh, you know obviously for the pentagon and uh, they've done many war games over the decades, uh, but always, you know, military invasions, armor, whatever. Uh, this was the first financial war game where the only weapons allowed were stocks, bonds, derivatives. The main countries, uh, contestants in the war game were the United States, Russia, China, and then we had another group representing Europe and hedge funds. My role, uh, the Pentagon knew how to play war games, but they didn't know that much about Wall Street. My role was to give them that expertise. And then I actually got to play on the China team, but I recruited a friend to join the Russia team, and we cooked up a little plot. We said, you know, let's give the Pentagon their money's worth and show them how the world actually works and the plan was to have Russia and China deposit their gold in a Swiss vault and then create a bank in London under English law that everyone would trust and this bank would issue currency backed by the gold so you as a country could come put your gold in the vault get this new currency but the kicker was Russia and China announced that henceforth they would only accept payment in this new currency they would not accept dollars the idea was to try to attack the dollar and you think about it stock derivatives they're all priced in dollars and people worry about a stock market crash but if the dollar crashes every single market crashes with it all at the same time so we this was the greatest threat we could imagine and it played out over a couple days it's all described in the book uh, it takes the reader you know behind closed doors at a top secret weapons laboratory where we conducted this so I hope they enjoy There's a little bit of intrigue there to start the book and I hope I uh, hope the readers enjoy it I think there's a lot of intrigue there and actually I'm quite intrigued because that was in 2009 it's obviously been a little bit of time and as far as non-military threats we've seen more very public emphasis on something like cyber warfare by both the Pentagon and NATO. That was one of their major priorities when I covered their summit last year. That, that's a new priority. But I haven't heard a lot of public uh, either consideration of this as a threat or as a tactic of financial warfare. Do you think that the Pentagon is seriously thinking about that in the time since? Well, not only the Pentagon is thinking about it, but it's actually part of Chinese military doctrine. There was a, uh, a book published in 1999 by two senior colonels in the People's Liberation Army. The book is cited in my book, so if you have my book, you'll have the, uh, the footnote to uh, point you in that direction, where they discussed specifically uh, financial warfare as a doctrine. Lauren, what you're really talking about, this is under the heading of asymmetric warfare or unrestricted warfare. Nobody can really stand up to the United States head to head. I mean, Russia still has a lot of nuclear weapons, but in terms of surface fleets, military, armor, marines. Nobody can really stand up to the United States in, in kind of head-to-head -head combat. But in asymmetric warfare, so that would be cyber, chemical, biological, radiological, financial, and other kinds of unrestricted warfare, uh, the, le the, the playing field is much more level. So this is a threat that's taken seriously. Do you think in the same way that cyber warfare is and, and has become more part of their tactics, do you think financial warfare is too? 
Uh, yes, it's something to think about. I think cyber warfare is more of an immediate threat. We're seeing cyber attacks every day. These financial attacks, we have financial panics in the market. We have financial crises. But I'm not suggesting that these are caused as acts of war. These seem to be, uh, I like to say, we shouldn't worry about the Russians or Chinese attacking our financial system. We're doing a good job of destroying it ourselves through <laughs> over leverage and, 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 and bad regulation by the, the Fed and others. So I'm not, I'm not saying the current financial panic are acts of financial warfare, although we are in a currency war. And that's a, that's a separate thing. Uh, the cyber warfare is more concerning. It's more front and center. It's happening all around us. Uh, but financial warfare is something that, uh, let's put it this way, if you were in an asymmetric war with the United States and you were, there were cyber attacks going back and forth, why not launch a financial attack while you're at it? It's what's called a force multiplier. Take the damage you're doing and make it worse. There you go. It's really certainly an interesting prospect. That was James Rickards and his book Currency Wars is on shelves now is they're coming up with contingency plans for a possible end of the euro that's according to the financial times and enter the central banks with their fire hose of dollars to try to put out the fire for now they hope the federal reserve the central banks of canada england japan the swiss national bank and the european central banks have joined forces to essentially bail out the euro for now markets look pretty happy about it today as for what the central banks are doing they are lowering dollar swap rates now this gives european banks cheap emergency access to dollars but what is firing off rounds of cheap money do for the global currency war that my next guest argues we are in? Well, let's find out because we have Jim Rickards in the studio with us. If you haven't read his book, I recommend you go out and buy it and do it now. It's right there. It's Currency Wars, the making of the next global crisis. Uh, and he's here in studio. We are so glad to have you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Lawrence. Nice to be here. Great. Well, let's just get right to this. Sure. So what do you think? In your view, is this the Federal Reserve bailing out the euro? Well, what they're saying is this is a masterpiece of sort of perception over reality. What they're saying is they'll do whatever it takes. In substance, this wasn't that big a deal. These swap lines have been in place for years. They do have to get renewed periodically. They, have to, they can be increased periodically. There are offsetting rates. So what the Fed did is we're going to make it a little bigger. We're going to make it a little cheaper. But it was more the signal. It said, look, uh, clearly Europe's in distress. Clearly there's a run on the bank in terms of dollars. And the Fed said, we're going to do whatever it takes. So the, 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 the substance of it was fairly small, but the message was huge, which is we'll do this, we'll do more, we'll increase them if we have to, we'll do whatever it takes. And that's why the markets were relieved. And that's why stocks went up. I mean, stock market loves free money. Yeah, they do love that easy money. But you said something about a run on banks. Yeah. And it's funny because there were some rumors and some speculation in a Forbes article sure. that, hey, was a big European bank, you know, not able to get money last night? Is that why we're seeing this decision from the Fed today? Do you think that there is kind of this quiet run on banks going on that the Federal Reserve and other central banks are trying to do anything to avoid? Well, yes, yeah, so it's actually been going on since last summer. It was, it was quiet, it was behind the scenes. It's not in anyone's interest to talk about. It. it was slow, but what's happened recently is it, the tempo has picked up, and it's, it's, uh, you can see how uh, Deutsche Bank is almost like a central bank unto itself. In other words, the European banks are afraid to lend to each other, but they will lend to Deutsche Bank because that's considered to be the strongest private bank in Europe, and then Deutsche Bank can selectively relend. Their balance sheet and leverage are actually expanding, so they look a little bit like a sort of a quasi uh, central bank. So, yes, it's a serious problem, seri basically a run on the bank, a run on dollar liabilities. Now, they may be able to fund euro liabilities from European insurance companies and European pension funds, but these are dollars, many of which come from money market funds in the U.S., and they're just saying, look, maybe you're okay, but I don't want to find out the hard way. I'm getting my money out. Um, and, of course, the ECB cannot print dollars. They right. can print euros, but for them to get dollars, they have to go to the Fed, so they have these swap lines. Now, interesting, from the Fed's point of view, they're looking more and more like a hedge fund. They've got longer maturity, they, uh, uh, U.S. government obligations. They've got more euro-denominated obligations. They're doing it with more and more leverage, so the, the Fed is in a very risky position, probably technically insolvent at this point. In, the Fed is insolvent. Sure. How can the Fed be insolvent? It because can money. well, they have 60 million of capital. Sorry, 60 billion of capital and about three trillion of assets that are legacy assets. If you uh, took the intermediate sector and just marked them to market, and, and the mortgages, they've got Bear Stearns assets. If you mark that stuff to market, you know we don't know for sure because they're non-transparent. But there's a good chance that the losses would be greater than 60 billion dollars, which would wipe out their capital. Now they're not going to say that. They're not going to put it on their balance sheet. But that, if you marked it to market, I think that's the result you would get. Really interesting. Now, you say that this latest dollar swap announcement is not a big deal in and, in and of itself, that right. it's more of a continuation, the perception. the perception. But what exactly does this do to the dollar? In the short term, doesn't it put pressure on the dollar? Isn't it bearish on the dollar? 
Well, it, it's sort of a conundrum. It's a very good question, Lauren, because what the Fed and the Treasury want is a cheap dollar. That's the, the, the key to the currency wars. We've been trying to cheapen our currency against all the other currencies. And yet, as much as we want a strong euro, the euro still gets in distress. So here, this is sort of a pretty much of an even swap. By making more dollars available in Europe, it actually should help the European banks to support the euro. So it's bad for the dollar. Good. Well, when I say bad for the dollar, the dollar is going down, the euro is going up. I've been saying since last summer, the euro is strong and getting stronger. The dollar is getting weaker, but that's what the Fed wants. So you can say it's bad news. I think it's bad news from the, from the national security perspective. I think it's bad for America, but it is what the Fed wants. Okay, so let's, let's stick to this, because if it puts downward pressure on the dollar and you say it's a, a larger continuation of mm -hmm. things, of a policy, it's also playing into your view of a currency war, right? Can you explain how? Well, because um, the, the, we have to have a cheaper dollar. Well, the theory is we want a cheaper dollar to promote our exports. You look at the components of growth, what are they? It's consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Consumption's flat. People are up to their eyeballs in mortgage debt, student loans, credit cards, et cetera. That's going nowhere. A little bit of investment, but not much. You're not going to invest if there's no one there to buy this stuff. Government spending has hit the wall because of the Tea Party and the deficit ceiling. So what's left? The only driver of growth that you have left is net exports, and the cheapest way to get your net exports going is to cheapen the dollar. That's the theory. So we could sell more Boeing aircraft, Microsoft software, General Electric wind turbines, et cetera. The problem is that your import prices also go up. With a cheap currency, you pay more to buy iPhones or whatever else. So this starts inflation into the United States. It's really picking winners and losers. That's not really the Fed's business, but that's what they're doing. Well, and on the flip side of that, you see China now, which is easing its monetary policy. Uh, what impact does this have on the currency wars? Well, they're shooting back because uh, for, they're shooting back. Uh, they're exactly, firing back yes. at the U.S. with this. That's exactly right. For a long time, China maintained a peg. Now, what was happening was the Fed increased the base money from 800 billion to three trillion, almost. <coughs> pardon me, over three years. Now everyone said, "Oh, that's going to cause inflation in the United States." and there were a lot of critics of the Fed. We never saw the inflation in the United States. The, the supporters of the Fed, like Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman were right about that. But the problem is our inflation went to China because China had to print their currency to soak up the dollars to maintain the peg. Now, about uh, a year ago, China kind of threw in the towel and let the yuan appreciate because they had an inflation problem in China. Once they did that, that inflation starts to come back to the United States. So it is coming back here with a lag. So the, this cheap dollar policy is going to be exactly what happened in the 70s. Inflation is going to take off. And of course, the losers in inflation are average Americans, savers, retirees, teachers, firemen, et cetera. The winners are you know, the speculators and the wealthy who can afford to buy gold or fine art or farmland. or They know how to hedge against inflation, but average Americans, it catches them by surprise. So I view it as a kind of theft from average Americans for the benefit of the wealthy. We're being stolen from, Mr. Exactly. Well, exactly. We're well, being stolen from. What happened in the 70s and it's happening, it'll happen again. We're going to see a repeat of history. Now, I just quickly want to ask you because uh, one more question. We don't have a lot of time for it, but sure. because last time we spoke, you were talking about how you see the future of the monetary system right. as a race between gold and SDRs. Correct. With this news that Europe may be going again to the IMF and saying, hey, we need your help, do you see this as maybe the IMF's chance to have a greater role for the SDR in the financial system at this point? I do, and I see it actually as, as an acceleration of that. This is something that you could very clearly see coming, but I expect it over kind of three or four years. It may be as soon as one or two years. Now, just to be clear, in the short run, the IMF has plenty of dollar credit facilities. The, the IMF has set themselves up as a World Bank in 2008, 2009, 2010. They went around the world and got commitments for uh, almost a trillion dollars of committed credit facilities from everybody, Netherlands, Japan, Germany, et cetera. They can draw those down at any time, issue SDR notes. Mm -hmm. So now for the first time, the IMF doesn't just have um, capital and assets, it's got debt, it's going to have a leveraged balance sheet. So it looks more and more like a central bank. And when they mm -hmm. issue SDRs, you're exactly like a central bank because you're issuing currency. So yes, that's happening very quickly and they're acting like a world central bank. So the IMF is turning into a central bank and the Federal Reserve is turning into a hedge fund. Everything uh, is morphing. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim Rickers, I want you to stick around right here. There's so much more I want to get to. I just really quickly want to explain to our viewers and our word of the day what exactly this reserve ratio business is with China. Yeah.
right, it's time now for Word of the Day, where I break down a financial term or concept for a very smart viewer, just but perhaps not the financial expert, you know, not the Jim Rickards in the audience. And today it is reserve requirements in light of the discussion that I've been having with our guest and also, of course, today's big news. China kicking things off this morning. The central bank there lowering the reserve ratio for banks for the first time since back in 2008. It is a move to ease to try to defend the Chinese economy from the weaker global outlook. And we want to put this in context. Okay, so this news about the reserve ratio, the reserve requirements, what exactly are there? Are they? Well, let's look at them in terms of the U.S. central banking system, the Federal Reserve. To explain, let's take a look at the definition, okay? This is the amount of funds that a depository institution must hold in reserve against specified deposit liabilities. Now, depository institutions must hold reserves in the form of vault, cash, or deposits with Federal Reserve banks. Okay, it sounds complex, but in plain English, this is simply the minimum minimum amount of cash that banks have to keep on hand relative to what they've lent out at any given moment. So think of this as representing their reserves, what I'm going to show you here. Okay, so if this is a bank's reserves, uh, say they have a reserve requirement of 10%. So this is their reserves, it's 10%. Banks can lend out 90% then of the money that they have. So this has an effect of expanding credit in the economy, as you just saw. Now, when a reserve requirement is increased, what does it do, okay? It forces banks to, re banks to reduce lending. So you see this come down because they have to keep more of that money in their reserves, in that pot that you saw down here at the local central bank. So they can loan less. So what is the effect of China cutting its reserve requirements for its banks as we've just seen them do? Well, in their case, it's by a half a percent. And this is basically a green light for the Chinese banking system to loan more and create more credit. Now, as a note, that is inflationary. It tends to put upward pressure on prices. But now you know it, what it is uh, that they've done this with the reserve requirements and what they are. Welcome back. In reaction to the Fed's announcement about liquidity swaps today, we heard from GOP presidential hopeful Ron Paul. He said citizens of the world deserve better than this. They deserve sound money that cannot be manipulated and created out of thin air by central planners who promise printed prosperity. Now, is that the problem? Is fiat money the problem? And could gold play into the solution? Well, we certainly see emerging market central banks stocking up on it. Countries like Mexico, Russia, and Venezuela is repatriating most of its gold. Take a look at the response, okay? These were the people cheering in the streets literally when Venezuela's first shipment of gold arrived from European countries. It came home to celebrations on the streets of the return of the country's gold. Now, we have gotten a lot of feedback from you, the viewer, on this topic and specifically about Jim Rickard's thoughts on a lot of these issues. So we are going to get a chance to ask him some of your questions. Again, he is Senior Managing Director of Tangent Capital Partners and, of course, author of Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. So first, Mr. Rickards, welcome back. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, I want to get to you because there was a little bit of a, I guess what you could call a back and forth between you and noted economist uh, Nouriel Rabini right. on the issue of some of these things, the gold standard. And, and Rabini said that the gold standard was kind of the cause of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And you disagree in the sense that it was the price of gold, if I'm correct. So if, you know, assuming we get the price right, why do you see gold as possibly part of the solution? Well, um, you know, the problem we had this uh, sort of Twitter war with Noriel Rabini, the problem I had there was that he ha clearly had not read the book. And I don't, if you read the book and you disagree, that's fine. I'm always ready to have that debate. But he said, doesn't Jim Rickards understand that gold contributed to the Great Depression? Well, of course I understand that. I wrote about it in the book. I said gold was part of the cause of the Great Depression. But as you say, Lauren, it was not the gold itself. It was the price. In 1925, the major countries of the world went back to gold, back to a gold standard at the pre-World War I price, which was about $20 an ounce. The problem is they had doubled the paper money supply to fight World War I. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go back to the old price with twice as much paper, you have to cut the paper in half. That was very deflationary. It did contribute to the Great Depression. Winston Churchill was the major architect of that. And he said later in his memoirs, it was one of the greatest mistakes he'd ever made. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I pointed out in the book that if we had gone to gold in 1925 at, say, $50 an ounce instead of $20 an ounce, 
that might have been inflationary and actually avoided the Great Depression. So uh, I was not unaware of the history of this. In fact, I wrote about <laughs> it. So uh, I felt uh, too bad that uh, you know Professor Rubini uh, actually hadn't read the book before he took a shot at it. But that aside, in terms of today, could we go back to a gold standard? The answer is yes. But you have the exact same problem. How do you get the price right? Mm -hmm. And people always say, well, there's not enough gold to support world trade. Well, there's not enough gold at $1,700 an ounce. But there is enough gold at $7,000 an ounce. In other words, the same quantity of gold will support any amount of underlying transactions depending on the price. So what I've recommended is not that we do anything you know, immediately, but have a, have a commission, a bipartisan commission, have experts study it for four or five years. It took 10 years to create the euro from 1990 to 2000. Why not study gold for a few years? Um, and then what would the variables be? How would you think about it? See, I don't know the answer, but I think I've got the questions right. right. First of all, you have to define what money. Every, every gold standard is a relationship between paper money and gold. Mm -hmm. So what amount of paper money? Is it M0, which is base money? Is it M1? Is it M2? Well, M2 is about six times bigger than M1, so that makes a big difference right there. Then how much gold backing do you need? You know, the gold bugs say 100%. That's not necessarily true. Great Britain ran it with 20%. The United okay. States ran it with 40%. So you've got choices there. And then who's in the club? Is it just the U.S. or do you include China? You get all different prices depending on those variables. Okay, but there's lots of questions to be asked. You're, you know, suggesting that they're more looked into. You certainly have our viewers thinking about what a kind of return to a gold mm -hmm. standard would look like. And someone from New Zealand actually wrote to us, uh, Michael Swatch, and he did some due diligence. He looked at the Bank of New Zealand. He doesn't believe that they have any gold. We looked at their balance sheet. It doesn't appear that they do. And so he writes that he's living in New Zealand and if he understands correctly the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has no gold if this is true what would a return to gold standard mean to countries that have little or no gold in their central bank well again it would be something like Bretton Woods now Bretton Woods it was not the case that every currency in the world was anchored to gold the way Bretton Woods worked is your currency was anchored to the dollar and the dollar was anchored to gold mm -hmm. now I think in a 21st century version of that maybe it would be the dollar the euro and the Chinese yuan. It might be three or four currencies. Sadly for England, they don't have much gold either. They, England actually sold most of their gold at $200 an ounce. Today it's almost $1,800 an ounce. They did sell for a very good price, no, that, was a, that was a bad move uh, <laughs> by uh, uh, the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown. But um, so I think the big three, China, Europe, and the U.S. would be in the club, and they would be set the gold standard. Then New Zealand and Canada and others could then peg their currencies to say the US dollar or the euro in some way. So that's how that would work. But it's interesting that for 15 years, central banks were net sellers of gold. And as you pointed out in the prior segment, they become net buyers of gold. There was actually a cartel. Did they get an advanced copy of your book? Uh, I don't know, but <laughs> we were, maybe we were thinking along the same lines. But maybe. yeah, it's interesting to me that you know Ben Bernanke disparages gold. The U.S. has not sold a single ounce since 1980. We've yeah. still got our 8,000 tons uh, stashed away, which I think is a good thing for, from a U.S. national security perspective. Okay, and just real quickly, um, we don't have a lot of time for a well, long answer, but uh, one of our viewers wanted to know if you were bullish on silver. They said, you know, you always get asked about gold. What are your thoughts quickly on silver? Silver will tag along with gold. I mean, it has, a, it has an industrial input, so it has a little bit slightly different price dynamics. At the end of the day, silver will go in the same direction as gold. There you go. Thank okay. you so much for being Thank on the you, show. Lauren. So nice to have you in studio. Go out and read his book. It's Jim Rickards. He is the author of Currency Wars. And uh, we're so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.